Anyways, well, let's go ahead and pray, and uh, we got a lot to uh, jump into tonight. The, uh, as it were, the proverbial thick of it, just each week for me, it's just like, there's too much information, <laughs> right? And so if you've been reading ahead, you know, uh, you probably get the sense of that too, but let's pray. Lord, thank you so much um, for your book, and uh, Lord, I've just been so excited about the things you've revealed and the things that you teach, and so, uh, Lord, I just, again, uh, like I do every week, I just ask that this be your time, because uh, this is your book, uh, and it's a revelation of your son, and so I just pray that your spirit would be in control. Um, use uh, the words as yours, and just uh, move me completely out of the way. Let it be uh, transparent to those uh, that are seeking to know you um, closer, Lord, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we got one more week. Uh, we got tonight and then tomorrow, and so I'm going to try to pull everything together. Uh, as I think I mentioned, chapter 10 is kind of like that parenthetical chapter where we saw uh, in the first go around of the uh, tribulation events. So we'll do that. And then um, again, it just cannot be too clear with you guys that we have to pay attention to the words and we'll see that tonight. Individual words matter. We just can't in our humanist you know, mindset go, well, in our daily conversation, those are kind of the same thing. Uh, you know, like down here, it's really bad because if you tell someone, hey, give me a Coke, good Lord, what you would get down here. You get a Sprite, you get all kinds of stuff, and back home, you just get a Coke, right? Well, actually, we wouldn't even ask for a Coke. We'd ask for a pop. And so any of you that are from the north here would be like, what in the world? But yeah, for us, it's a pop. And so, but the idea that individual words are so important, um, you know, we're going to see tonight, we're going to see, uh, you know, an angel that is called a hymn. And we're going to see other angels and things that are called it, right? One is a thing and one is a personality. <coughs> so you have to pay attention to those things. Otherwise, you quickly will take your theological car and put it right in the ditch and not have any way to get back out because you violated a rule of scripture, which is to understand that individual words matter. And so just keep that in mind tonight. Um, and then, uh, like I said early when we first started going through this study, that when we get to a place where I'm doing a little more, um, I hate to use big words, but the only word I got is eisegete the text. The idea, if I'm trying to put something into it, I will let you know that, hey, this is kind of opinion. This week, actually, I was looking at notes and different comments from people uh, on different things, uh, pastors that have discipled me. And this week, I got to a Y in the road where I have just two pastors that I wildly represent, you know, uh, acknowledge as having good insight and they're over here right and it's just like i love this man and this man is so good and it just like and they just couldn't be more different and uh and that's okay like i said i think the bible at least in revelation there are just some things that god has left for that time and we're just not going to know and so i'm comfortable in living in what i think is uh the most accurate just again not based off of my opinion or based off of my experience, but simply by going to other parts of the Bible and um, studying. Grandson interrupting me. So you gotta stop when the three year old's going like this. <laughs> CJ. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm back. And so the idea is you know, when, when you're in here, uh, we're gonna pay attention to the, the individual words and we're gonna let the Bible be the Bible. We're gonna let the Bible be the best commentation on itself. Uh, God, you know, did not sit around and go, man, I wonder how I can give these guys some clues as to what I mean. You know, this, this was not a challenge for him. It more, more than anything else, it's just like, well, I would imagine that if I just, within the confines of this book, give descriptions of what that word means in other parts, maybe they'll just be able to follow the chicken seed and put that stuff all together. And a lot of times we make it harder than we need to because I understand the idea of meanings within the original text and the original audience. And there's a place for that when you're studying the Bible historically, but sometimes we get too hung up in that and we don't allow room for a God who is outside of time to teach us both historically. And then as we've mentioned devotionally, how we apply it to us. And then doctrinally, does it even apply to me at all, right? There's just parts of the Bible where he's dealing with, you know, we talked about the Jews and their issues and we just can't go to the test, uh, the text and arrest it for the church just because that's what some guy at some uh, church or seminary says that's what he does, right? And so be willing to, you know, move your thoughts away from maybe even things that you've been preconditioned with to the position of 
if that's what the Bible says, I'm just going to be okay with moving. And that's hard for us because, you know, obviously we wrestle with what pride, you know, and, uh, uh, ladies, I know your husbands in here don't have a lot of pride ever. You know, it's just like, hey, I think we should have taken that road. Oh, no, this road's better, right? And that kind of thing. Um, guys wrestle with it. I wrestle with it. And so, like I said, I'm perfectly okay that someone can bring the Bible up here and show me with God's word that, hey, you know, that, that might be really more this way. I've had to change, and that's okay. Um, you know, as God you know, reveals things to me. So let's get started. Again, just to give us... The, a running start into this is, is the how we got where we are because there's so much information. Sometimes we get so deep into the woods, you know, we, we miss, you know, we miss the forest of it all. And so this again was just an overview that I had showed you guys before. And so where we are, we are uh, where we are tonight is we've moved through the first overview of the tribulation period, which was at Revelation six through eight one. We saw that uh, fulfilled with uh, the opening of the seals with the book that the Lord Jesus Christ took and opened himself, culminating in the passage of Revelation 6, 17, which is a passage that would show his second coming. And so then we moved into events in heaven, and now we are into uh, the trumpets. Last week, we jumped into uh, the trumpets one through four, and then we kind of ended the time with an angel saying, you know, only because they didn't have to, John didn't have the terminology to use anything other than woe. Woe would be the strongest word um, that he would been a, been able to muster. You know, we might call it something else to communicate something that is. You know, we might use the word in the English as horrific or you know abominable or something like this. But woe was the deepest thing that he could put to this. And so we saw a movement through the first four trumpets. And where that left us then was an angel saying, man, I mean, as bad as that was, uh, it just is going to turn a corner. And when you've reached the point where this just seems unbearable, uh, you will actually move into the point where it's not just a bad day. It's not the worst day of your year. Uh, it will culminate in being the worst days of your life. In a, it actually... All of humanity <coughs> is going to be moved into a suicidal condition, if you can imagine that, that all of humankind is going to be seeking death, right? They're actively going to be trying to end their lives on a mass <coughs> scale. But God says, you know what part of the punishment is? You're not going to be able to even find death. Uh, it will flee from you for a period of five months. And so you will have people who are tormented, <clears throat> looking to end their life, and yet whatever the means of that suicidal attempt are, they are now going to live with the consequences of whatever that was. Knife, gun, picket, whatever it is, jumping off of buildings, you're just going to hit the ground and with the torment of what it felt like to fall four stories. Because it says that death flees from these people. And so... Hollywood could not probably even write this script because it would be too unfathomable. You probably couldn't get people to show up to this movie because of the uh, how extreme it is. And then as we move into um, uh, beginning in January, that's another note. Uh, we'll pick back up. We'll have one more week next week, and then we'll pick up. I believe it's January 11th, and we'll move into uh, the personages where we see key players of the um, Rebel Book of Revelation, and then ultimately the vials and. and and so on and so forth. But as we came through the trumpets, we saw trumpet number one, we saw hail, fire, and blood. And a third part of the trees were destroyed. And we also saw that not some of the grass, all of the grass. So now all your grazing animals and all the stuff that depends on that, that then ultimately becomes food for people, uh, your cows, your you, you pick it, right? There's just no feed to be had when it comes to green grass. Uh, we saw that in Revelation 8, 7, and the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. <coughs> and a third part of the trees was burned up, and all the green grass was burned with it. Uh, we saw in trumpet number two, <coughs> as we're recapping, that there was a great mountain burning with fire that lands in the sea. Uh, we had reason to believe, based off of what John could picture, is uh, the idea. Uh, this, you know, if we saw a picture in a science book, you know, of a comet or of an asteroid as it enters the uh, atmosphere, that this could be. Again, we say could be. We're, we're making again at, at this point some speculation that this is the only thing that makes sense. That 
you would see a fireball that's entering the atmosphere that looks like a mountain, uh, yet it's on fire. And so that's why a lot of people would land here. And we saw that in Revelation 8.8, 8, where it says, And the second angel sounded, as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And it goes through all the devastation that, you know, you move from uh, the, the hail and the fire, and now you've got this comet, and we are just getting started. Uh, and then we have a great star, and we talked about this, uh, 810, and the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers. All throughout the Bible, we do see stars being synonymous with angels, right? That's not a, a weird thing for us to see that. And so how we have to land on this is we're looking at something that's probably more inanimate, but you know, by the fact that it uses the word it. But again, uh, being a star, is this now, uh, again, it is weird that some of the comet movies that we have in Hollywood actually have a small comet and a large comet, just like it does in Revelation. So I don't know the parallel, but it's just a weird that it could be possible that there is one that is greater than another. And this one, what it does is, so if it wasn't bad enough in the first two, well, now a third of your drinking water has been poisoned. And so uh, however that plays out, um, that is now in these people's world during the tribulation. And then the sun, the moon, and the stars lose a third of their light. Uh, you know, scientists tell us tell us that if you have an asteroid or a comet that is of a certain side that you actually get over time what could potentially be what they call a planet killer, that kind of stuff, and that you actually, from just one impact, can have ash that goes into the atmosphere, and it stays there for months, and if not years. And so if you can imagine a haze of, uh, you know, maybe if, those of you that have been in a, a blizzard or a really foggy day, that that just is your life for months upon end. You just don't see anything other than a hazy part of the sun. And so God tells us that, hey, the third part of the sun and the moon and all of these things are going to be dimmed. And so that's where we landed as we came out of the trumpets. <clears throat> and so... Again, to help you guys get your head around this, because, you know, the conversation then is, well, how do these line up? Because, you know, you guys have heard me teach you the idea that we're going to go through four separate movements through the tribulation, culminating in the second coming of the Lord at the end of those movements. And then people get confused because they're like, well, in one of them, there's a third, and then there's another one, there's a 25%. So if it's showing Jesus Christ coming four separate times, why do the numbers change? And the reason that the numbers change is because either the entity or the event that is causing the death is separate from the other one. So while you have 25% in the, in the um, <clears throat> first uh, part of the Bible, it talks about the sword, you know, when you have the, the um, horsemen, 25% die with the sword, hunger, death, and beast. Well, that's different than something that's poisoning the water. So while you have the total of the population dying from the one, you can have another segment of the population dying from another, and then ultimately in the third one, another part of the people dying from yet another. It doesn't change uh, the events. We're just getting different representation of seeing those separate things happening at the same time. Does that make, does that make sense? Is that clear? So I, I started running back out the numbers. The first time we did this, we saw that, I think if we're generous, maybe, <laughs> Maybe you've got 500 million people on the planet that would be Bible-believing uh, Christians. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're Baptists, right? There are plenty of unsaved, quote-unquote, Baptists that will split hell wide open, right? We're talking about people that have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, have done it by grace through faith alone, like Ephesians chapter 2 tells us, and that they have been truly born again. So again, just for the sake of making my, my math easy, these aren't numbers that you're going to find. I'm just giving us an outline to kind of give us some general idea. So if we have 8 billion people, which we talked about, they tell us that right now in November, sometime in November, that is the number we'll hit. We're going to lose a half a million of the church in the rapture. Then the horsemen show up with the seals and through sword, hunger, death, and then also beast, it says, we're going to lose another 25%. And so if we take 25% off of the 7.5%, uh, we're going to get down to 5.625 billion. So the so think about that. We couldn't handle 
the death in this country of hundreds and thousands of people from the pandemic. Remember what a nightmare that was? The trailers, there was no trailers. They were out in the streets. That was hundreds. What do you do with hundreds of millions? Think about every house, every street, there are gonna be bodies everywhere. I mean, you think about these numbers. So you've got 5.625 using our math. When you get to uh, the poisonous waters, you saw that many die. We don't know the definition of many, what that number could be. Could it be another third? I just went light and just said, let's just call it another billion. So now you're down to 4.625 billion people on the planet. And then when we get into tonight, we're going to find that there's going to be four uh, demonic angels uh, and an uh, uh, army of 200 million people and their horses that are going to kill definitively a third. And so this is all happening kind of overlaid at the same time. And so when you take those people out based on who's left, uh, you're down to about half the people that are on the planet is all we have left. And we're going to start moving into the Battle of Armageddon, which is a major battle, major loss of life. And then that's why, you know, Jesus said when he got to the uh, end of this, um, by the time it's all over, 50% of the population at least is going to be uh, going into that final Battle of Armageddon. And Jesus, we saw this, except those days should be shortened. There should be no flesh safe. We literally, in the last three and a half years of the tribulation, are on a definitive path to full extinction on this planet if Jesus does not step in and make things right. And it talks about in some other um, prophecies that there's just a small remnant that actually enter into the millennial time. I don't know the definition of small. I know it's less than five billion people. So there is an enormous amount of loss of life in that. <clears throat> so Revelation 9, 1, 2 we pick up here and it says and the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth and unto him was given the key to the bottle in this pit okay so we went from this idea of an inobject an inanimate into an animate into a, a personality so now becomes the big Theological, theological debate. <laughs> Who is him, right? That's just the natural question that comes out of this. So we'll try to answer that question as we go through here. And to him was given the keys to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the reason of the smoke of the pit. So before I uh, address the him, this idea of bottomless pit, Jesus all over the place talks about that hell, the bottomless pit would be within the earth. We can debate all the verses that lead you to that, but it says when he died, he went to the center of the earth. And so there's not a lot to talk about, but how do you arrive at something in a center of earth that then does not have a bottom, right? It doesn't make sense because even if you go through the earth, you're going to come up the other side, but how does that work? And so the best understanding that I was able to find is this idea of th think of maybe like your your dryer right at your at your home so within the core of the earth you would have magma and and all these other kind of things going on at the surface of the earth we do know that the surface is moving at approximately 1,000 miles per hour it doesn't seem like that but that is a calculated known scientific deal and so what happens is you have a soul as it were when they are in this bottomless pit there is no bottom because the top is moving. You're never reaching. You're just simply bouncing in and around this thing. You're never reaching a bottom. And it is inter interested when you talk about, you know, the devils and stuff that were sent to the, the bottomless pit. It says, it says that they are sent to the sides of the bottomless pit, right? The idea that it's ever turning. And so you can have something within the earth. And again, I think we do pick and choose the unbelievable that we want to believe. We've taken some other stuff. And so, like I said, this may be a reach for you, or it may simply be, that's what God says, I'll roll with it. I don't know that I know how that works, but you know, the idea being that within the planet, you can have a situation in which things can tumble at the core as the surface is moving, that things could at the center be moving around. So you can achieve it mathematically that there is no bottom, because just as soon as you start to get to somewhere, gravity and everything else then sends you back the other direction and you never arrive at anything thus giving you a, a bottomless feel which would be kind of weird that you'd be tormented that way that you're just literally 
turning through you know a lava like environment never and, and perpetually falling that's the other thing people talk about that they miss is the idea that they say um, theologians say that hell will be a state of perpetual falling um, which that's kind of scary in and of itself so the fifth angel sounded and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit and so a lot of people will land just because there's initially verses that look like it can support it by the language and so what we'll do is we'll read this here on the back the, the fifth trumpet it says a star falls from heaven and this is um, on the screen and it's also in your notes here a star falls from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit some teach this as Jesus Christ I personally would not believe that this would be so and I'll explain the reasons why they land here and then I'll also explain the reasons why I don't land here again you do your own study I'm just giving you where I think the Bible ultimately lands you and then you guys can find out where God takes you the reason that Jesus is the angel of Revelation chapter 20 and 1 with the key to the pit to bind Satan and this would be true when you go there we see Jesus Christ as the victor binding uh, the devil in that situation <clears throat> an angel uses the key on me I'm gonna skip there I'm sorry um, but God can give a key, then take it back later. Have you ever loaned your keys to someone? So the idea being, he just like in Job, right? God was in control of everything in Job's lives, but he put boundaries, right? Initially, he said, hey, don't do this. You can do it. And then ultimately, he says, hey, you can do anything you want. He basically was giving or reserving the key to Job's life, right? He's like, you can touch Job any way you want. Just don't kill him. So ultimately... God was giving permission to Satan to the key of Job's life with restraint. And so the idea that God can give that away and take it back at will is not a stretch. <clears throat> in Revelation, and so in, uh, an angel uses the key to close a pit in Revelation 9, and an angel uses a key to open the pit. Um, where did I go? Yeah, this is so small. Yeah, okay. Have you ever loaned your keys to someone? In Revelation chapter 20, an angel uses the keys to close the pit. And in Revelation 9, an angel uses the key to open the pit. That is the same key, but for two different purposes at two different times. Others say that Jesus has the key to hell and death, Revelation 1.18. So that's a true statement. So this angel has to be him. That is the rationale that you know, in 118, it does say that, but let me explain why maybe this is not so. But the uh, the key of hell and the key of death and the key of the bottomless pit can all be different keys. You know, how many keys are on your keychain, right? I mean, you have different keys. The angel in Revelation 9-1, in my opinion, cannot be Jesus Christ for a number of reasons. The first and foremost is this. The angel in uh, Revelation 9-1 falls from heaven, Okay. Nowhere in scripture do you ever see an account of Jesus falling from heaven. We know who did fall from heaven, right? And entities that did fall from heaven. But never do you see this. And, and this is like redundant throughout the Bible. Because when you go to John in chapter 3 and verse 3, uh, 313, I don't know if we put this up here. Did I put this up? Here? No. Okay, that's right. You'll see in, in John 313 that he talks about he came down. From heaven and then when you go read John the chapter 6 32 through 58 uh, Jesus used the exact term seven times to communicate clearly that he did not fall from heaven but that he came down from heaven right there's a difference and it's a huge difference so looking ahead for a brief moment in Revelation 10 1 we see a mighty angel that does come down and it is the Lord Jesus Christ and so what ha happens here is we see that an angel is doing their deal, a personality in nine, but when we get to 10, which comes after nine, and I saw another angel. So this one's different than nine. That's why it can't be Jesus Christ because chapter 10 is so clear that it is Jesus Christ. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow, and was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet pillars of fire. When you go through this, there's, it's undeniably the Lord Jesus Christ right but the difference being in verse 9 you've got an angelic being that is falling and you hear in chapter 10 see the Lord Jesus Christ who obviously does not fall so, so does that make sense 
And so, like I said, there's there's a lot of people. And again, study out. I don't argue with people. If people want to say, no, nope, I still think because based on Revelation 1:18, it's still got to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's fine. Just explain how Jesus is falling from heaven. Um, I can't find that scripturally. It doesn't support anything doctrinally, theologically. It just doesn't work with everything else we know about how He controls who He is. <clears throat> <clears throat> no, I would I would suggest, and we'll get there. That the the bait is this: most people land it's 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 Satan or it's Lucifer or it, it, it's Jesus Christ. I would say it's not Jesus Christ. What I'm saying that I believe is happening here is that just like he did in Job, in order to fulfill his ultimate judgment purpose. Is he gives them the key, because we do know that a lot of his hoard, as it was, were locked up, right? He takes the key and he says, do your deal. So when you go and study Job, uh, Job will read different for you once you understand that Job is a picture of the nation of Israel during this time, okay? Uh, you're going to find that the parallels there are, are just unmatched. And we were talking about it before class. I get... That chapters and verses and all that stuff came at a later date. It just is interesting that the Great Tribulation period is the last three and a half years of that time period. How many months are in three and a half years? Quick mathematicians? 42. Right? Well, it's just weird that Job has 42 months, right? And that he's walking you through the persecutions. And so Job is a representation of how the Antichrist will come against him as the nation and everything that's going on there is just this big picture of Israel in tribulation, right? So again, though you read too much into it, that's why there's a whole lot of math that then there's hundreds and hundreds of math equations then that are just crazy coincidences. So yeah, so what I'm saying is, is God gives him in his permissive will to fulfill the judgment on the planet is it's your time, do your deal, because it's gonna end, but you have rain right now. And so I, I believe that he actually gives it to Lucifer to fulfill that or accomplish that. Revelation 3.12. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And so we start talking about, is John having a hard time describing things because he can't make sense of 21st century technology, or are we seeing things that are demonic and spiritually inspired? This, because of where they're coming from, I think would fall in the latter, that these are actually spiritual demonic beings because they are coming up out of the planet where when we see the 200 million army, that could actually be more of a literal army versus a spiritual demonic being. And that's where it gets tricky is letting the words around the text kind of def define where this is more of either a spiritual thing or a physical thing. I would think that these locusts would be demonic and, and we'll talk about why I think that is the case also. So there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. Well, I thought that was the whole purpose of locusts, right? So out of the gate, they're not even natural. So is this before the grass is destroyed? After all the green grass? What are they talking about? Well, we saw that all of the green grass is gone, so they wouldn't have anything there, but there was a third of the trees, I believe, is the mass. So there still would be vegetation, plus any other agricultural things, corn, things, you know what I'm saying? So, I, I, again, I'm speculating that things outside of grass could still be vegetation. But what is unique is that they're told, hey, you know what? Don't worry about that stuff. And so that's so out of character of a natural locust. That's why I think this is a spiritual thing. But only, but here's the deal. It says, here's what you can hurt. But only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. You remember who those guys were? The 144,000, right? So God tells them, hey, listen, you can hurt anyone on the planet. You can't touch my people. So that would lead you to believe that there's also going to be lost Israel, Israeli uh, uh, people that are going to be a part of this because it's only limited to those 144,000 preachers. And it was given unto them that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. So, I mean, again, if the nightmare isn't got you sweating and screaming yet, now you've got these locusts with these stingers and this kind of stuff that are able to torment men and hurt them. And it says that their torment was as a torment of a scorpion when it striketh a man. So it's one thing, I was out working at my farm and uh, I upset a, 
ground hornet. He decided to come up and tag me right here. And I'm like, oh, well, that stinks, right? And, you know, I'm just like, that's really discomforting right now. But we're talking about not a bee sting, not a, uh, a viper bite or something like that that goes away in hours or days. We're talking about something that has you literally in severe agony for five months, right? You just can't get past this pain. And their torment was the torment of scorpion when he striketh a man. And then we see the confirmation of why we say in those days as the language of the Old Testament, why that is a picture of the tribulation period, because we see it defined in Revelation. And in those days shall man seek death. Well, what are those days? That's the current days that we're in here, so we know that's tribulation. So when you go back to the Old Testament and you see a phrase that says, and in those days... Be attentive that, sure, there was probably some historical things that were going on, but they're giving you a picture in those Old Testament uh, <coughs> prophets that this is probably going to happen again in the tribulation. And so that's why that key phrase, and we talked about that uh, in times past. And in those days men uh, shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. So this isn't a someone who's having a bad hair day going, oh, I just wish I would die today. This ain't that. This is literally going to the cupboard, grabbing a knife and slitting your wrist, hoping you bleed out. And you do bleed out, but you live with the consequences of whatever that means on your body. You know, forget the analogies of what you could do with a gun and what kind of damage that does. And you have to live with that torment for five months. But that's what the Bible is, is um, presenting. Because men's gonna find all kinds of ways to stop the pain but then the judgment is they got to live with that for five months too. So you can't even get your head around starting to think about of all the ways men and women take their lives. Well, they take their lives, but these people are going to live with this for five months. You know, driving their car into something. Pick, pick the analogy. It's just going to be, you know, really, really uh, weird. And so you got five months of people that wanting to die. And part of the judgment is, you know what? God purposely lets <laughs> death flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were likened to horses prepared unto battle, and their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. <clears throat> and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots, of many horses running to battle. Uh, and again, it is just an absolutely incredible scene of these people just running across the planet where you have a, an entire society that is suicidal. Uh, they're already killing each other because we know this time that men do or have evil in their heart continually. So if these things ain't killing you, you have other men wanting to kill you. It just don't get no worse than this. And they had tails like those scorpions and there were stings in their tails and there was power to hurt men five months. So now this gets really interesting. Uh, and they had a king over them. Okay, the locusts have a king, that's interesting. Uh, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, Abaddon uh, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. These words mean destroyer. Uh, one woe is past, behold, there come two woes more after. Okay, so um, this is the asterisk for the night of, do hear me, I'm not making doctrine right now, <laughs> all right? But this will get maybe a, a little sideways for you. I'm just telling you what I have read, what I have seen, no, you guys can say it for me. Go read it yourself. Go study this. This, I would imagine, will be newer to most, if not all of you. Um, but it is what it is. So we do know that the culmination of Revelation, we do not get ourselves worked up on the idea that it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ returning, right? That's an easy thing for us to digest. When you look at the two witnesses, you can argue over who the two witnesses are. Most people agree the first one is Moses. You can argue... Enoch, Elijah on the other. It doesn't matter. We have Old Testament people coming back as part of this. And we're like, okay, we will be coming back. Okay, you got me right. Where, where, where's the challenge here, Lou? I'm going to suggest to you that there's some other people that have lived in the Bible that uh, this gets weird, don't it? I know where you're Yeah, going. this gets weird. And so <laughs> that gonna you're going to be like, all right, I've never heard that, but let's let the Bible be the Bible and find out who this king over the locusts are. <laughs> We do know back in Proverbs, and um, I don't know that uh, I have it up there, but uh, look up my, uh, Alexi, uh, that Proverbs 30, 27, and I'll just have you read it when we get there. No, no, just read it from your Bible. 
Or, oh, okay, I'll read real quick. Let me just go there. So I, I don't have this on the screen, but let, but let me read this because, again, this is why I so love the Old Testament and why I just love the Bible in general because you got these little nuggets back here that in Revelation it tells us, okay, we got a bunch of locusts that had a king over them. But we go back into Proverbs uh, chapter 30 and in verse 27, and just out of the blue is God's working through some different stuff. It says, the locusts have no king. Yet go they forth, all of them by bands. Okay, well that's either a contradiction, which the Bible never is, or they're speaking of a physical locust, right, that has no king. That's what leads me into these locusts having to be a spiritual entity because they have a king, right? So, so they can't work because we know the Bible doesn't disagree with the Bible. We simply have to turn our thinking and say, okay, they just simply have to be a spiritual demonic type of locust. And then this makes perfect sense because then Proverbs doesn't apply to them. So who is king over the locust horde? Anyone got a guess? Who is this angel? Who is this person? Satan. Huh? Satan. Okay, Satan's a guess. Okay, it's influenced by Satan, but we won't keep you in suspense because I only got 17 minutes to try to work you on this. <laughs> so, like I said, we're not gonna stab, we're not gonna put this on the church website as the About Us page and what we believe. We're not going there. I'm, I'm saying consider the text. And you go wherever you want with it. So we do know they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. Okay, we know the bottomless pit is, uh, is a judgment zone. So we also know then that an angel can be a devil, right? It's a fallen being. So we don't have to take that angel word and just assume it's a white guy in a robe and all that type of deal. So we can go to the idea that we have a devil at the bottomless pit. So he is a king and a devil of the bottomless pit. <clears throat> This is just, uh, all right, let's get back. Let's get back. Let's, you go. Let me move back. <clears throat> Are you moving for me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here. Okay, so king over the locust horde. Who is this? Again, just for fun, just speculation. You decide. The angel of the bottomless pit, again, we'll have, we have to delineate that this isn't one of God's angels because why would he be in the bottomless pit, right? This is a judgment zone, so we have to make the assumption that it's a devil. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, we're going to see a word that comes up called son of perdition. Uh, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What's that day? The day of the Lord, right? We know that. That's just like in those days. Except they're coming a falling away first, and that man of sin, who's that? Antichrist, right? Be revealed. And who is he? Son of perdition, right? That doesn't come up a whole lot. Very, very, like twice, Okay. And so some of you are quickly going to have some light bulbs going off above your head, and so that's going to be good where this is headed. Revelation 7, 18 tells us, and when we'll get there, that the beast that's coming up of the bottomless pit, so this is the same beast that's coming up back where we're studying chapter 9, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and whoever the beast that's coming out of 9, 4, he's going to go into perdition. Okay, perdition is this idea of, of who this is, the Antichrist. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Right? We're seeing someone who's trying to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ in the idea that he was, you know, I was and I am and I shall be, right? And so they're using the same language of, hey, I'm trying to take this same road. Who else was called the son of perdition? Judas, Judas right? Okay, so it's gonna get weird, but it's gonna get fun, right? So John 17, 12, while I was with them in the world, this is the Lord Jesus Christ uh, praying, I kept them in thy name. Those that gavest me, I have kept them, and none of them are lost. But the son of perdition, that scripture might be fulfilled. So he's saying, hey, Judas, son of perdition, he wasn't one of mine to begin with, right? So now we have to make the same analysis that the Lord Jesus Christ is, which is you have to tag son of perdition not only to the Antichrist, you have to tag it to who? Judas. All right? Hang with me. Acts one twenty five. That he may take part of the ministry and apostleship. Who was that? 
right? Judas did all those things. He was a part of the ministry. He was a part of the apostleship. From which Judas by transgression fell. Lucifer fell by transgression when he said, I will seven times. That he might go to his own place. Okay. If I'm going to my own place, where am I going tonight? Going to my house, right? Generally, for most speaking, that's the place I own. That is my place. And what's really, really interesting when I studied this out, when you go back and you type in the word own place, you see a theme of in Job and in Samuel of like Job's friends kings from the east they came from their own place they were rulers they were kings in samuel you'll see kings came together did some stuff and then they went back to their own place so the idea of your own place is that you possess something so if judas fell that he might go to his own place that would suggest that he is the king of something somewhere right i know it's getting weird john 6 7 Jesus answered them, and have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is like a devil. One of you is filled with the devil. One of you act like a devil. What does Jesus say? One of you is. You are a devil. Speaking of Judas. Okay. 1711, and the beast that was and is not. Even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And it would literally take me two weeks to do that one verse because it goes into Roman empires and rulers and how they line up over history. Believe it or not, there's two hours of teaching that one sentence. Um, but that's what is going on there. So what you have is Judas, all right, who was a type of Antichrist, who then kills himself. There's actually a prophecy for all this back in the Psalms. It's really weird uh, about everything that he was going to do. So where I'm, I'm taking you with this, and we'll read this in a minute, is another guy that's going to show up is the king of the locusts who went to his own place. It doesn't leave you anyone else that the next character you find coming in Revelation is Judas to come and complete what he was doing, which was betraying and trying to subvert the Lordship Jesus Christ. So again, we don't have no problems with, yeah, Moses, Enoch, Elijah, got it. Yep, we're on horses. Fantastic. Lord Jesus Christ, absolutely. You're telling me Judas is coming up out of the bottomless pit as the beast, as the king of the locusts, leading that horde? Well, you guys go jump into your strong concordance and you run those verses and you understand what it means when he is <clears throat> coming from his own place and jesus said he was not like a devil he was a devil from the very beginning and then i don't have time nor would i try to explain to you well then how is he a devil how did that happen because that doesn't even make him human well go understand genesis 6 <coughs> who his mom might have been with to cause him to be a devil and so you can run that as far as you want, but we don't have time for that. Now, that would probably end me in the principal's office uh, type of deal. So how many questions does that answer or does that track? Enough for you to at least go study it yourself? That the king of the princes or the king and the demon, the devil of the bottomless pit, who is leading these guys, is the same guy who went to his place for a season, right? And so, again, if that wasn't enough, Psalms has a prophecy about this guy. And this makes it even weird. Psalms 109, 615. It's one of those chapters you may have never even read or you read it. It's like, what does that mean? So think of this with <clears throat> Judas in mind, right? Set thou a wicked man over him and let Satan stand in his, at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few and let another take his office. Remember what happened? They got together and they elected Matthias to take his office, right? Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg and let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath. Remember he threw the 30 pieces of silver back to the extortioners and they went and bought land with that. So uh, and we'll work through all this in a minute. Let there uh, be none to extend mercy unto him, neither let there be any to his favor, his father, his children. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generations that follow, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers 
be remembered with the Lord and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Again, that's the key. Well, if Jesus, if Judas was a devil, what was his mom doing? And God said, hey, you know what? I don't want that blotted out. I want you to go figure out who that was and how that happened. Let, their, let them be the, uh, before the Lord continually that they may cut off the memory of them from the earth. And so it reads like this. This isn't in your notes, but these, ver these verses clearly speak prophetically of Judas. Satan stood at the right hand when he indwelt Judas personally, <laughs> verse 6, uh, speaking of this passage. Uh, Judas's prayer became sin when he repented and tried to give the money back to the Pharisees, verse 7. Peter quoted verse 8 directly in Acts chapter 1, speaking of Judas when they chose Matthias to replace him in the apostolic office. The children of Judas were fatherless, and his wife was a widow when he hung himself, verse 9. And the extortioners caught 30 pieces of silver and bought a field uh, with it in verse 11, again up here. His posterity was cut off, meaning not only did the physical line, but his legacy as well, and their name is blotted out. And we know this because uh, does anyone call their kid Judas? I don't know Judas. Have you ever heard of, hey, I want you to meet my friend. His name's Judas. I've never even heard that as a thing, not even from a distance, right? So we know he's been blotted his name that way. And then um, verse 14, the iniquity of his father would be those who were of their father, the devil. And in John 8, 4, 4, you see the idea of... Um, you know, when he's talking to the Pharisees that, you know, you are of your father, the devil, that type of stuff. And so again, if I'm reaching, then tell me I'm reaching. All I know is that that's what that has to say. It lines up in seven, eight, nine different points of who uh, this Judas guy was. Again, I know that gets weird. I know that isn't typical Baptist around town theology. <laughs> Nobody goes there. I get that probably maybe even went over a whole lot of people's head and I'm sorry, but I think it's important that if you ever do go back and study and you want to know, well, who was the king of the lotus at Locust? At least you have an angle to approach that someone at least gave you a direction to go rather than a whole lot of, oh, it's just some demonic angel. So is that saying Jesus is part of the unholy trinity? Like if, he, if he's the beast going in? Right, that's right. And so the soul of Judas fills the beast and then you have the dragon, the, the father head, and then the false prophet. Yeah, so his soul would be a part of that triune thing. Again, everything Satan's doing is in the attempt to mimic what Jesus Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit are doing. Again, I get it. It's weird for me. I'm just following the breadcrumbs. Again, go study it out for yourself. And uh, you know, I know some of you email me. I'm looking forward to the email, so that'll be fun uh, to tell me uh, how I've lost my ever-loving mind. And so, but uh, again, track it. But when you pay attention to the words, um, you know. Uh, Judas is much bigger of a character than we gave him credit for, type of deal. <clears throat> Revelation 9, 16, 16, <coughs> 13 through 21. And the six angels sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. So, again, we just believe God uh, that... There will come a time that there are angels that are chained within the Euphrates River that they will turn loose. Um, we're also going to find that there's going to be, uh, along with these four angels loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of men. This isn't saying how long they're slaying men. This says there's an appointed hour. You know, like we tell men, hey, you know, we're appointed to a certain time. God knows that minute, that second. Same thing here is these, these guys are appointed to a task for a very specific time. And thus I saw the horses and the vicious, and then it sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of the jacinth and the brimstone, and the heads of the horses, whereas the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. <laughs> By these three, uh, and so the three are the angels, the horseback riders, and the horses themselves. Uh, the brimstone... Uh, and by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouth. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. And it is interesting how a lot of times as humans, we're a lot like that. Because how do we slay men with a four-inch piece of muscle that lays right there? We can tear someone down way worse than we can take on a back to them. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship devils of idols and gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear. Neither repented they of their, and is this not a picture of today? 
we just will we make murder excusable within sorcery what do they use they use a mixture of stuff and drugs and actually in the again i'm not the big you know greek person but if you study out sorcery it is from the greek i think it's pharmica or something like that where we get our word pharmacy and so you have people today that they just after all this stuff is going down they will not repent for their murders their drug use their sexual sin and of their thefts they're still just that obstinate in their sin and in who they are and so what happens is let's go back and talk about this you have four demonic angels Again, how they're held or how God keeps them, it says that they're within the Euphrates River. The Euphrates River is a very important river because it actually would have bordered where the Garden of Eden would have been. There's a lot of stuff that went on biblically with that river. Um, the 200,000 army with uh, horses, you'll find that people, and I would tend to lean towards this being more of a physical uh, because it just talks about them coming from the east. And for a long time, I mean, when John wrote this, there weren't 200 million people on the planet. And he's writing about an army of 200 million people, right? Well, if you're going east of Jerusalem into the big country of China, they've had a standing army of 200 million people for like decades. That is not a reach. And if even, and if even China couldn't put it together, the kings of the east, India and China, you can easily get to that. Again, I'm not saying that that's what it is. I'm saying it's a possibility. And then the question is, well, how do they get from there to there? You know, you've got this big giant mile and a half wide Euphrates River. Well, in Revelation chapter 16, it tells us that God will dry up the Euphrates River. And it's really weird this week when you go to YouTube and you watch about the Euphrates being at all time lows. Parts of it are actually already dried up right now. And um, they're just like, this makes no sense. And so it gets as weird as you want to go. Not that I spend a lot of time on conspiracy sites on YouTube. I'd rather watch things with bulldozers and things like that but but again the reality is you can go and see that the Euphrates has issues and we know that the Lord is going to use that as part of his prophecy and so you're going to have these demonic angels which they hate humans right they, they are bound for a reason so people argue that maybe they were part of the angelic host that mingled with women in Genesis 6 who knows but there was a reason that the Lord said these are the wicked of wicked and I, I have to restrain them. Otherwise, it would just be awful. And so when these dudes get turned loose and get to influence and you have all these demonic locusts that come out and you have the, the demonic, four demonic angels and you have this army, again, just when you think it ain't gonna get any worse, now you're dealing with all this stuff and it just says, you know, that the punishment and, and the death that comes with these guys are just going to be, um, astronomical and so again we talk about this I, I could spend weeks on a sentence in Revelation so I'm trying to give you uh, some high points that you can go study this thing out but again uh, there are I've got I put two billion or you put two billion that's supposed to be yeah it's supposed to be 200 million you got excited you got excited with your comma um, yeah, yeah yeah it's not two billion it's 200 million and so uh, again the idea being that um, the devil, uh, the Antichrist, the beast, they are going to give freedom to rain judgment upon this planet. And like I said, um, we are now just through, you know, the second woe. I mean, it, it just keeps coming and coming. We have, like I said, a society that is suicidal. People are killing each other in the midst of all that. They still are engaged in idol worship and sexual sin and drug use. It just... Again, I can say it to him blue in the face. I don't know that we can even draw the conclusion in our head what a world like that would be like. It just, you know, you can't. You, because we, we don't have any bar to set it by. Be like, oh, yeah, I can imagine that. Because I remember when this happened, right? You talk about a good vacation. It's like, oh, yeah, it wasn't as good as my best vacation. We have bars for things. There's no bar for this. There is no there is no way to get our, our um, heads around a true unleashing of, of hell on earth. So um, we got couple of minutes or those that want to leave to the strip 7 30 but did anyone any, you guys have any questions up through this like i said um uh i know the middle part was kind of uh you know it blew my hair back that's why i just shave it because i I'm a study guy. i got tired of my hair falling off just blowing my hair back and so i just shaved it that way god can't blow my hair back yeah. and uh but again like i said i don't try to put anything that i have into it i try to let the bible be the bible yeah 
you mentioned earlier that the abyss is going to be the center of the earth. What happened in chapter 3 when you have the new earth? Well, I'd imagine, well, according to Revelation 20, he takes the old earth, and it says in Hebrews, I think it's chapter 3, that he takes the universe and he rolls it up all like a scroll, whatever that means to God. He just rolls it all up. And the beast and the prophet, the false prophet and the antichrist, and the judgment after the great white throne judgment, all of that then is tossed into the lake of fire, would be the way I would read that according to Scripture. Does that answer the question? And then from there, in that nothingness... He creates a new heaven and new earth, and that's not weird for us to get our head around, right? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was void and without form, right? And darkness moved across the face of the deep. So the idea that he can start with nothing, he's done that. That ain't hard for me to get my head around. He's just going to start from nothing again. Because all of creation is cursed, and so he literally has to not just purge man, purge his planet. He has to purge creation, and so I think that's why Hebrew speaks to him rolling up the universe as a scroll and then it all goes into the lake of fire how that all plays out i don't know my friend <laughs> way above my pay grade i just know that i'm going to be on the good side of all that stuff No, he's not. He's, he, he is in that triune. He is the beast. And, and again, as we move into chapters 13 and stuff, we'll see what they do. Because there, there's going to be an idol that literally is man-made that moves around and it's alive, right? And people say, oh, that's like A or something. No, this is like a, an idol that literally is alive. And so you're going to have um, the false prophet, which is the religious leader. And we can talk about who that is. But no, they're, I, I believe he fulfills the beast and then he supports. He's a supporting character within that. Just like Moses and Elijah or Enoch is the supporting leaders for the 144,000. They lead those guys. So again, it doesn't give us the detail or I, I don't know it. But he's subordinate to Satan. Well, sure he is. Yeah. 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 But somehow, because again, just, just how we can't get our head around it, how can Jesus be on this planet yet he is the Father and he's still in heaven? The devil's pulling off something like that. How can he be the soul of Lucifer but yet have the spirit of Satan? Right? He's working things out. Now, again, Satan is not um, omnipresent, right? but in that capacity locally, he can appear to be divine. And that's what's going to fool everybody, is he's going to have amazing powers. So I think the beast is actually, uh, you know, he'll, he'll be supported to um, you know, the Antichrist in the political format. The false prophet, obviously, is the religious leader of the whole system. So, and we'll see about the religious system in Revelation chapter 17, the great whore of Babylon. Anything else? Another question too. Okay, I think I asked you like after class. So when is it that the fog is going to come over the people? Is it before we're raptured or right? Before? No, it'll be after the church is gone. It, the the timeline, if you follow with God, is once the church is gone, that He will cause them to have a strong delusion. Again, He provided the way, the truth, and the life, and we said, I ain't got no time for your truth. And God always gives you what you want. So, so then again, there's not going to be any of the, um, like, everyone's going to be raptured up, and there's not going to be anybody that's going to go immediately go, oh, no, I screwed up. No, the, the text would not support the happened. person. Yeah, you know, like when you read the book series of people going, oh, I know what happened. Right. That's not going to be the case. Now, keep in mind, there is a great delusion right now because it says that the God of this, what, oh, world... Okay. He blinds us. So that's him doing the blinding. Once his blinding is done, God steps in and says, they didn't want my truth. I offered the truth in light of his blindness, but you don't want it, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to blind you myself. And you get into, um, I, I think it's Psalm chapter 1, um, and I'll let you guys go, but this is, I think it's Psalm chapter 1, or it's Proverbs chapter 1. Uh, Psalm chapter 2. Uh, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. You know, I mentioned that before that, wow, that's, that the Lord gives you what you want. And while you're doing through this, he's in heaven and the Lord, um, he that sitteth in heaven shall laugh. That's tough theology. I don't know how to reckon that. But of course, I guess if, if any, like anyone dies naturally, then that's when they know for sure that they 
I don't think anybody gets to heaven or goes to hell. If they had an opportunity to hear the gospel, they're, they're doomed. Live up your best seven years. But there's no, there's no fog with them in, in hell. They, they, if they can automatically be sorry. No, they're done. They're doomed. They've, they've, they've said no when the grace was able to be applied to them. The people that the 144,000 are preaching to are people that literally are probably within Muslim and Hindu and different countries that really never had the chance. And again, I don't know how you reconcile that with Romans chapter 1, other than that's the grace period where heaven cries out so that man does not have an excuse. Again, it's God's economy, and I don't pretend to understand it. I just know that there's going to be the greatest revival this planet has ever seen when these 144,000 Pauls are running around giving the gospel of the kingdom. It's no longer, hey, accept Jesus Christ so that you can be saved. That ain't what they're preaching. They're, a, hey, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back and he will set his kingdom. What are you going to do with that? Okay, you believe he's coming? You believe he's the Lord? Okay, now the bad news is you have to endure to the end to make that work. If you take the mark, you're done. So that's their gospel. It's the gospel of the kingdom. And that's not our gospel, obviously, which is awesome. So, and it's so, fun. So if a baby was born yes. during that we talked briefly about the age of accountability. Oh, okay. Yeah, the idea that God knows the heart, and when someone actually recognizes their sin for what it is, some people that could be eight, seven, some with learning disabilities, maybe 20. But again, God works that out. I trust him that you know he wants all children to come to him, and that he, you know, right. he, he, he rebukes people that keep children from him. That and so, pregnant that are automatically going to be... Yeah, I, I would say again, when's that soul implanted at conception? Yeah. I guess, I don't know. Nobody knows. But let me get you out of here. I love the questions. And uh, one more week. And uh, my mom even texted me. She does this from there. She's like, what am I going to do for eight weeks? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> she was stressing out. So I, I have fun too. But let's pray. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for this group of people that just love your book and love your word. And uh, Father, right now, as you've just uh, asked us to do, we just hollow your name. And thank you for being holy, uh, being righteous in your judgment. Uh, but Lord, we do know that we, we do not try to make men fear because of how bad they are, but we try to reach men as Romans chapter two tells us because of the goodness of God. And so Lord, you have been so good that you've provided a way for us that while there's still time, that we can tell our friends and our family and our neighbors about the goodness and the love that you are, Lord. So I pray that we would do that with the time that we have left. And uh, Father, that we would be ministers um, for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. um, I was gonna...